his very long uh, introduction. Uh, he is a pediatric anesthesiologist who has worked for 20 years in pain research uh, and management. He's a professor of anesthesia and psychology at Delhi University and medical director of pediatric pain management at IWK Health Center in Halifax. Uh, he has many publications to his credit and he has presented more than 250 uh, presentations in six continents. He started a pediatric pain email discussion list in 1993 bringing together pain researchers, clinicians from over 40 countries. His own research and educational projects have recently taken him to Jordan, Thailand, China, Brazil, and India. And uh, his focus is advocacy of improved pain management for children in both developing and developed countries. Uh, on June 9, 2010, he was announced as uh, the inaugural holder of Dr. Uh, Stuart Venning Endor Chair in Pediatric Pain Management in the, uh, at the IWK Health Center. Sir, uh, Dr. Alan Fridley, please, uh, you can start your presentation. Thank you very much uh, for that very kind introduction and thank you very much to Dr. Madori and the organizers for inviting me here. Uh, it's a, a, a true honor and pleasure to be back in India and be able to take part in this uh, conference. Um, in your program, I'm there giving two talks, one on uh, the difference, uh, the perspective of a child uh, not being a small adult and one on visceral pain. So I've actually merged those into one lecture so we don't have to stop between, so I have half an hour. <laughs> One of my colleagues years ago, with respect to anesthesia, but really applies to everything, uh, said that it's a serious mistake to treat children like small adults. Uh, but if you treat adults like big children, you're probably going to be just fine. I'll remind you of the definition of pain, uh, originally from the International Association for the Study of Pain. And the addendum to it that was added shortly after it was produced, uh, reminding everybody that uh, just because you're too young or unable to communicate doesn't mean that you're not experiencing pain and that you don't deserve treatment. <coughs> Now we all know that acute pain is there for a reason, it warns us of danger, it protects us. Uh, this uh, painting by the Spanish uh, artist Goya, 18th century, uh, shows a young boy 20 minutes before arrival in the emergency casualty department with his uh, superconductive fracture. Chronic pain, as you all know, deserves, serves no useful purpose. I actually like to split this up into three categories because in terms of how we manage it, there's really a difference between instant pain, short sharp pain uh, from needle procedures or what happens when the surgeon examines your belly right after the laparotomy. Um, continuing pain from tissue damage, which includes both surgical and trauma damage, but also cancer and other diseases that that uh, destroy tissue. And then chronic or complex pain, which is a, a really complicated interaction of, of biological, psychological, and social uh, components. This uh, position statement from the American Pain Society uh, expresses it quite well, that chronic pain in children is the result of an integration of biological processes, psychological factors, and social and cultural context. That part's true for adults. But you have to look at it within the developmental trajectory. So chronic pain in an eight-year-old is not the same as chronic pain in a 12-year-old, and nothing is the same as chronic pain in a 16-year-old, because 
adolescents are really a different species from the rest of us anyway, right? Um, we have persistent ongoing pain and also recurrent or episodic pain uh, that can fluctuate. So any attempt to separate chronic pain into organic and non-organic has no meaning because any ongoing pain involves some neurosensory changes that are physiological or anatomical. We know that there are many risk factors for chronic pain. Uh, inadequate treatment of acute pain is particularly relevant. And one of the important things is that acute pain that's poorly managed in the neonatal period and infancy and childhood probably has much greater impact than the same thing happening in an adult. The uh, neuro and that neuro, uh, neurological system is changing throughout that period and uh, untreated pain in neonates, infants, recurrent needle procedures and so forth can have uh, huge long-term implications. Just to put this um, in perspective, uh, when I'm talking about chronic pain today, I'm talking about the sorts of things that we see in our clinic. So these are all types of pain without really ongoing tissue damage. I'm not talking about cancer pain or palliative pain or pain, even pain from arthritis and uh, sickle disease and things like that. I'm talking about the persistent pain from recurrent headaches, from chronic widespread pain or fibromyalgia, uh, CRPS, and uh, a, a, large range of, of issues. It's important to remember that pain has an impact not only on the child but on the family. Uh, it may interfere with school and, and, but also with how whether parents can work. Uh, has a direct and indirect economic effect. You know, if you miss two years of work in your 40s, that's unfortunate. Um, but in many countries there are social supports for, for disability insurance and so forth. But what if you miss two years of high school? That's a huge impact. That has a much greater effect on your life and on society than missing two years of work as an adult. Uh, this study from uh, Chris Appleston's group in, uh, in the UK uh, showed uh, that this was based in a rheumatological hospital in Bath where they do a huge amount of really brilliant pain research. Um, the combined costs to the health system and the family with chronic pain due to arthritis and other causes was 8,000 pounds a year, but it almost doubled if this was undiagnosed Pain, pain not due to uh, arthritis or an obvious disease process. Uh, similar uh, sort of, or related research rather in the US, which of course is a different system, uh, showed that multidisciplinary clinic treatment reduced visits to specialists, therapists, costs, radiology investigations, outpatient visits, and particular, of particular interest to parents hours spent in medical appointments. Um, and so, of course, that has a huge impact on, on the family. <clears throat> um, there have been a number of studies of chronic pain prevalence in the community, which um, bring, up, bring various numbers. But let's say, for argument's sake, that of the probably 5% or so of children generally who have recurrent and chronic pain, 1% of the total has really severe pain that's causing disability that would benefit from multidisciplinary care. And think about your population and how many children that involves. We have millions of children in India who would benefit from multidisciplinary care that to be honest, it's not very expensive. 
One of the other problems with chronic pain generally is the difference between pain and disability. In the types of kids we see in our clinic may have pain that causes them distress, but they continue going to school and doing all their activities, or they keep going to class, but they drop their dance classes or their sports or their, their fun things, or they don't go to school very much, they keep up with work at home, or they don't do anything, they're in bed at home and not, going, not doing schoolwork, not doing anything that's fun. And this disability level does not seem to correlate particularly with pain intensity. So we still don't know really what the underlying mechanisms are. And we don't really have a clear answer on what changes pain into pain plus disability. And we certainly don't know how we're going to deal with the huge numbers of kids so that they need our help. So, what can we do? It's a problem. So I'm going to describe our approach to children in our multidisciplinary clinic and how it's organized. Um, first approach, the important thing is to establish trust and a therapeutic relationship and to believe what the patient's telling you because quite often these families have been to multiple physicians and other practitioners who told them that there's nothing wrong or they don't believe them or whatever and, and so they're very suspicious of professionals. Don't hurt them more when you're examining them. Offer reasonable hope. So we say we don't promise to cure the pain. A lot of patients the pain goes away but we don't promise that. We usually can make it better than it is and we can almost always make your life better than it is. So that's our goal. It's really a rehabilitation goal. Not as opposed to an interventional curing goal. So a couple of nice quotations from work by Bernie Carter, who's a nursing professor in the UK. And she did some qualitative research on children and families seeking chronic pain uh, treatment. So this is from a child. Listen to what people with chronic pain have to say. Treat them as people no matter how new they are. Doctors get really patronizing. They just get really fed up with it. Remember what families have been through before they come to see you. It's same questions over and over, conflicting advice, the, uh, the leap to the head, the family members who either don't believe them or have the answer, and conflicting advice about what they should, the family should do. Another quotation from Bern Carter's work. This is from a mother who said, the hardest thing was feeling like we were being judged and found wanting. That they wanted to find a problem with the family. And that puts them under the family under a great deal of stress and pressure and can be self-fulfilling. The more you ask them whether there's marital troubles or arguments or financial difficulties, the more likely there are to be arguments and difficulties. And remember that it's not just the child. It's not just the, the leg that hurts. It's the child that hurts and the family that hurts. And the things that interfere with the child's life are also interfering with the parents and the brothers and the sisters and the holidays that they can't take or the time they have to spend going to medical appointments instead of to football games. I'll tell you about one patient we had who was 15 years old when she woke one morning with just excruciating back pain and couldn't go to school, couldn't get off the couch. Her relatives just said she was being lazy and she should get up. She had over a year of multiple visits with physicians and other health professionals and referrals, finally got to CS, started a long-term program with physiotherapy, uh, CBT, gabapentin, and amitriptyline, which actually ended up in pretty high doses. Um, after some time, a year or so, she attempted to wean off and, and had a relapse of pain. 
We helped her get through school. We helped her with uh, to organize a program where she was going part time and doing correspondence courses. Um, our members of our team even visited the school and met with her teachers. And so we followed her for several years. She had a very positive attitude. Uh, her mother actually needed more support than she did. Um, she saw these slow but steady gains. She graduated high school, she got into university, and we were planning transition to an adult program after first year of university. But then she called us and said, could I come into the clinic? So we made an appointment and she came in and she said, I just wanted to tell you that my pain's all gone and I've weaned off most of my medications. So I don't know what we did, but it worked, so we totally took credit for it. But she achieved this essentially because of her own attitude and work and, uh, and uh, uh, success. This is one of our younger patients who did this. He started out with four spots of chest pain that were probably chondritis. Uh, costochondritis and uh, ended up with allodynia all over his body. He, he spent the summer without a shirt because it hurt too much. And then he gradually improved. Uh, a lot of parents have a feeling that they've seen a specialist who said, well, there's nothing I can do, and that they've been written off and, and told to go away. And that's very frustrating. As uh, so we were talking earlier, I was saying that one of the problems is that they go to surgeons and subspecialists, and everybody tells them what it isn't. No, it isn't your heart, it isn't your lungs, it isn't your bones. Nobody tells them what it is. And this is very frustrating for families and, and it just adds to the fear and anxiety about what might be happening. When we do a history, when we do an assessment, we want to know what treatments have been attempted, how it affects school, how it affects activities. And uh, this is again Carter's term, professional ventriloquism, it's where you ask a question and interpret the answer to be what you want it to be without actually listening to what the patient really said. <clears throat> we try to put together what we used to call the three Ps uh, psychology, physiotherapy, and pharmacology, but now we call the three M's, mind, movement, medicine, and in fact, motivation. Put this together as a single package because that validates the psychological part of it. If you tell somebody, if you treat somebody with drugs for three months and then say, well, you know, this isn't working, I think you should see the psychologist. You might as well just shoot the psychologist because you've destroyed any chance of them believing or taking it, uh, the patient taking it seriously. I'm very lucky. I work with outstanding colleagues, uh, advanced practice nurses, clinical psychologists, and physiotherapists. Um, my key to success is always finding people who are smarter than I am to work with, and then I take credit. Uh, but uh, we worked as a team. It's not my clinic, it's the team's clinic. And uh, we evaluate the patient all together in the same room at the same time and put together a plan together. So, lots of issues. This is, uh, these are quotes from a study of actually patients from our, with arthritis in Scandinavia. What the psychologist does is a number of different approaches um, guided by what seems to be working best for the child and what they need, including addressing negative thinking and, and helping them take charge of themselves. Um, it's difficult for these kids because they look normal, but they can't do things. And what they can't do varies from day to day, so their friends may not understand it, and it really interferes with social development and friendship. Our advanced practice nurses are uh, outstanding. They work with the patients and the families. They teach them. They support them through the system. 
They help them manage friendships. They uh, provide a lot of, uh, the, as I said, support to the teenager. They collaborate with the schools. They uh, support the parents, because the parents, as I said, have hugely difficult time. The, the worst thing in the world is seeing your child suffering with pain and not being able to do anything about it. So uh, they often need a lot of support. So the nurses do a lot of this by phone as well as This is a lead into the physical part of things, this quote, but what's also interesting is the bottom sentence there that says, you get mentally tired from not knowing what it is and why. So for many of these kids, it's the, the uncertainty, not knowing whether they have some horrible disease or not, what the pain is from, that's the, the worst. I like this cartoon, I just found this recently. It's the mind-body problem. Yeah? No. Movement is essential. So, as it happens, our physiotherapist is quite brilliant, and what he does mostly is not physical treatments, but education. And we use a lot of the principles developed by Lauren Mosley and David Butler in Australia, that hurt does not equal harm. We're trying to teach these kids that just because it's painful doesn't mean it's dangerous. And it's, uh, you know, scary, but, but it, and it, it's real pain, but it's not dangerous pain. So, decreasing the threat, uh, brain training, read it motor imagery, and mirror therapy, things like that for unilateral problems. Uh, nerve uh, mobilization, uh, pacing and graded exercise. Uh, always do a little bit more today than you did yesterday, but not much more. And I have to be there for some reason, so I guess that's to occasionally give some drugs. Um, I'm not going to go into detail there. You know, all know about all these drugs. And it's really not that much different except that opioids are really rarely used uh, for most of the problems that we see. And interventions are very, very rarely used because most of these issues are not localized enough to make that an appropriate approach. So now I'm going to jump to a subset of chronic pain, which was the second topic I was given in a few minutes. Um, which is the visceral pain piece. Because uh, that's an interesting component. This girl said, I've had pain in my stomach for two years. It seems longer. One doctor told me that what she was seeing on examination and what she was being told were two different things. I was 11 and I knew I was being accused of lying. This made me really angry because it didn't help the pain. It actually got worse. And it really hurt me to be called a liar when the pain was very real. That's a huge issue for kids. In fact, visceral pain is, in some ways, uh, one of the most frequent forms of pain. And it's often managed by pediatricians, gastroenterologists, general practitioners, who aren't primary pain physicians. We don't really have good animal models. We don't fully understand mechanisms, and we don't have anything specific as analgesics for these problems. As you know, visceral nerves are really different from somatic nerves, and uh, the somatic pain relief strategies don't necessarily work very well. Recurrent abdominal pain is the most common issue that you would see in children, I would say. Um, and uh, that can be as a manifestation of irritable bowel syndrome, or it can be related to inflammatory bowel disease that's in remission, like Crohn's disease or osteoporosis. Um, there's often no pathology to be seen uh, by normal and, uh, imaging and investigation. And we think of it as probably a, an, an aspect of neuropathic pain, visceral hyperalgesia, 
peripheral and central sensitization. I'll tell you about another patient. So this girl had abdominal pain since she was an infant. And we, you know, there are lots of kids like this, intermittent, sometimes, you know, bothersome belly pain. But after an episode of gastroenteritis, she had huge exacerbation. Pain was out of control. She was missing school, but keeping up with her work. Interfered particularly with ballet class, which was her life. And so this was devastating. Um, all her GI workup was negative, but from her point of view, it felt like something was ripping out her insides. It was rumored that she was dead or had cancer, and when she went to school, kids teased her and said she, they might be able to catch this pain from her, which of course was terrible for her. Sleep was interrupted. So she had been working on CBT with a superb psychologist, which helped a lot. Got her back coping and returning to school, marginally improved in pain. And then she had a dramatic response to Gabapentin. Uh, which to me supports the concept of it being a primarily neuropathic. Now, it didn't last forever, but at the time it worked uh, remarkably well. So I want to talk a little bit about needs. Um, people in the pediatrics world have talked about functional abdominal pain, which sort of carries baggage. It kind of implies that it's not real, right? Stedman's Dictionary only 10 years ago said not organic C-neurosis, which isn't very helpful for most patients. Um, dysfunctional pain rather than functional pain. Som somatization has been uh, eliminated as a term. Pain amplification is what rheumatology uses, um, which is not inaccurate, but it sort of sounds judgmental, as if the patient's amplifying. Primary pain disorder has been suggested by Neil Schechter. Now, the really interesting thing that's happening is that ISP and, and related groups have been um, pushing for specific pain codes in the ICD-11, um, which hopefully will be coming out sometime in the next few years. So, with specific coding for chronic primary pain in different sections, including primary visceral pain and subsets of that into primary chest pain, epigastric, irritable bowel, primary abdominal pain syndrome, bladder pain, pelvic pain, and then secondary visceral pain from inflammatory disease. So this is a way of providing validated terminology and diagnoses, which I think will help patients as well as practitioners because it, it gives them a, a accredited label for what they're suffering. I'm going to run a couple minutes over, I think. Um, so common diagnosis for visceral pain include the ones I've talked about, and pancreatitis, and kidney stones, and bladder spasm. Um, one of the challenges with visceral pain is that all the visceral organs uh, are innervated through uh, three or four uh, ganglia, but, but there's no a uh, single pathway for any of them. So they all share a neuro nerve pathways to the spinal cord and thus to the brain. So you get all sorts of confused uh, um, synergies. You have inflammatory disease in one organ, you may get pain in other organs because of the shared uh, nerve pathways. And that's also when you get um, somatic pain uh, referrals. <clears throat> One of our patients had chronic hereditary pancreatitis with years of pain, which her physician, primary physicians tended not to believe. Um, hyperesthesia, different drugs tried, uh, celiac plexus block was ineffective. Some decrease in the area of pain, but not in the intensity. She ended up having a pancreatectomy, which at that time was being done with new technique then of collecting the islet cells and trying to implant them in the liver to prevent diabetes. Um, 
that is now a successful technique, but it didn't work so well for her. Um, her pain didn't resolve after surgery at all, so she had prolonged opioid use, weaning over years. And the, interestingly, the somatic pain referral in her abdominal wall stayed intense but shrunk in size over time, shrinking down around her umbilicus over literally years. So we know we get peripheral and central hypersensitivity, and there's lots of research evidence for this in animals and people. Um, this is IBS patients. We get, uh, there's evidence of some inflammation even in irritable bowel syndrome. There have been Cochrane reviews trying to look at uh, treatment modalities, uh, which have been variably successful. We would suggest that it's worth a trial of drugs like gabapentin. Uh, it's pretty safe, often dramatically successful. Sometimes it doesn't work at all, but nothing lost. Um, <clears throat> tricyclics can also be effective, but of course slow the gut down, so in the variable level that may or may not be useful. Um, so, as I said, not much really definitive. Opioids, we would very, very rarely use, but occasionally, if we can show that the function improves. I had one patient who took one milligram of hydromorphone every morning, and it sometimes one in the afternoon, and that she could get up and go to school and do everything if she did that, and she couldn't if she didn't, and it never escalated in dose over years and there was never any diversion or misuse. So that was appropriate. Sorry. I've got two more slides, three more slides. Is that okay? Um, so, remember non-pharmacological techniques, look at the neurodynamics, use a multidisciplinary approach, and I think we know what to do. One of our patients wrote this in an essay for school, and I thought that was a brilliant uh, attitude. But she had to be extraordinary just to keep up. And another of our patients, the most important thing we did was believe her, and that was a very good lesson for us. And I will welcome you all to Nova Scotia and Canada in October for the International Farm. At this point, we just take one question. There is a little question answer session later, but anybody has one question? Okay. <laughs> Sir, I see you are working with uh, the adequate uh, Can you give it my mic? Yeah. So, yes? Uh, what is the usual approach in general who are suffering with sickle cell and what you Sure. Um, so we share patients with rheumatology for the arthritis patients, and we, we help with the pain management there. Um, to be honest, in where I practice, we have one patient with sickle cell disease. That's all. Because of the, the historical uh, patterns of uh, migration to our area. Um, so in, in Nova Scotia in, in the 18th and 19th centuries when most of the uh, black people who could be susceptible to sickle cell disease moved to Nova Scotia, if you had sickle cell disease, you didn't survive the winter because there was no heating and uh, so we have not really none in our local population. But I treat that, I would regard that as both a, an acute pain and a chronic pain sensitization. So obviously opioids for the acute crises, but also drugs like gabapentin or amitriptyline for longer term. And uh, sometimes the same with the arthritis patients, although they are now responding so well to the biologic and anti-arthritis drugs that we don't have very many patients that that have ongoing long-term pain from that. 
Is that okay? So hopefully we'll have more discussion at the end with yes. everybody. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, sir.